Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lord's house. I'm glad uh, to see you all here. Um, it is fantastic to be here in the Lord's house, um, to have, um, I suppose, a lineup of, of Christmas carols really gets us in the mood for, for Christmas. So it's an exciting and hopefully you will all enjoy worship this morning um, as we sing some hymns and listen to the Lord's word. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Our dear, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the good news and the great hope that we can find in our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you, Lord, that um, we can have this hope uh, through your mercy um, amidst everything that's going on in the world out there, that we can find peace and comfort in you and your word. Father, we just ask that you help us to prepare our hearts this morning to receive your word and help us to prepare our hearts to, to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus this coming Christmas. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, give me a second. Get my notes in order. All right, I'm back. <laughs> well, it is, of course, almost Christmas time. You know, you, you can feel it in the air, almost. Be like lovers in the air. Christmas is in the air. You know, the decorations are out. You know, shops are beginning to be filled, and people are, you know, starting to make their preparations for Christmas. And, you know, we are here today as well to sing some Christmas carols. You know, for me, there's just such great expectation, great anticipation around Christmas. It's a wonderful time of year, you know, and, and that is, I'm sure, the same for most people. You know, there's not many things in life that I can say that I truly look forward to, I truly anticipate, but Christmas is one of those, you know. I also have, a, I guess, a wonderful and, and recent example, too, of something that um, me and my family greatly anticipated, and that was the recent birth of our little son, baby Lucas, who, who turns four months on Monday. You know, I'm sure it is with all children that there is great anticipation surrounding their birth, you know, from within the family, um, you know, and, and this was the case for, for our little boy. The anticipation was there for a few different reasons, you know, for Suki and I, um, you know, this was our first, our first boy, our third kid, first boy, you know, not, not that we would favor, uh, you know, one over the other, um, that's not it, but it was to be a new experience, and so we, we look forward to it. On the side of my family, you know, there was great anticipation because it was believed that this would be their final grandchild, and they too were excited to have a first male grandchild. You know, in addition to this, there's always great anticipation to see, you know, what this child would look like as well. You know, it's something that Suki and I, has talk, we've talked about this for years. You know, if we were to have a third child, who would this kid look like? Would it look like her? Would it look like me? You know, she wanted to look like, look like her and I wanted to look like a me. Um, we almost talk about it every night. You know, and this debate still goes on now, four months later after his birth. We keep talking about who does he look like? Now, of course, you know, when someone says it looks like her, she gets happy, and someone says it looks like me, I get happy. But, you know, just to get it out there, if, if you all see her and see him, I'm happy for you, just to, in order to make her happy, just say that he looks like her. <laughs> and then just give a slight wink and tell me later. You know, I think it's great to anticipate something, to have a build-up and an expectation, you know, and when that event arrives, it makes it all that much more special. You know, this is how it should be with Christmas. You know, it was the case for the very first Christmas where Isaiah prophesied well in advance the birth of the Lord Jesus, and he detailed the importance of this birth and whom this child would grow up to be. The wise men knew this. The angels in heaven knew this, and Mary and Joseph, of course, knew this. And their expectation, their anticipation would have been great. The words of our first carol encapsulates this anticipation. And it says, Come, thou long-expected Jesus, 
born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. This Christmas, I want to make sure that the significance of the Lord's birth is not lost on me. I want to really anticipate the celebrations that will be had and to praise our Lord and Savior with my whole heart because I know his significance is such that he was born to set me free. I'm going to ask you all to sing this uh, Christmas carol with me, 124, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Well, the last couple of weeks have been interesting and challenging for me. You know, during a period of of seven uh, working days, I was called to serve on on a jury, um, in a court, of course. You know, in most cases um, that, you know, you, you get called on, and certainly for that week, would be sort of two or three days, fairly simple type cases, But my case happened to be the longest of all the cases that week. I happened to be so lucky. You know, there was lots of evidence in this case to go through, uh, lots of witnesses. And it was clear very early on that this was not an open and shut case. You know, it was a a fairly, I guess, contentious one. You know, each day of the case, um, it felt like the mood with reference to the verdict would change and it would keep shifting. And it dawned on me how important it was to really take this decision seriously and to make sure that I and the other jurors came to the right verdict. You know, it's, it's a burdensome feeling to think that you are charged with judging the guilt or innocence of a person and that you have a part to play on the outcome of that person's life. You know, while the case may have been contentious, the law, um, you know, it's, 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 the law itself is, is rather black and white. You know, you're e- either guilty or, or you're not. The, the character of the person may come into it a little bit, um, and this was argued by the defense that, you know, this guy was a, a good person, hadn't committed an offense before, uh, generally, you know, no, no criminal history. But then the prosecution would argue back and say, well, you know, all criminals would have had to commit the uh, first crime at some point in time, which, of course, is very true. You know, it's, it's just hard to think that you're either guilty or not guilty and that one mistake that someone makes could actually change that person's life forever. You know, the courts are set up in this way where even if you want to, you can't throw this person a lifeline just because he had made a mistake or was otherwise a good person. It is black and white in that sense. My thoughts during this case was around, you know, how one day we would be judged when our life ends, and that only the Lord knows our every sin. You know, there's no need for a jury, you know, because the Lord knows our every action. But this doesn't have to be, and this was not a, a thought that gave me any sense of fear. In fact, it was quite the opposite because, you know, I know that even though we'll be judged, we have this great hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, while we have sinned and and we will be judged, there is this amazing grace that is poured out um, onto us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are saved from our sins through the Lord. You know, the significance of the Lord's birth should not be lost in us this Christmas. It is wonderful that we can sing these carols in the lead-up to Christmas as we prepare. In our next carol, it says these words. It says, Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. You know, this Christmas, the focus is all about the Lord Jesus Christ, as it should be. The significance of his birth is not to be under, understated or taken for granted. You know, we may not get a, a great amount of grace or mercy from our, our court systems and judgments here on earth, but I am reminded that we have an amazing hope 
in our Lord and Saviour, whom pours his grace and love into our lives, that one day we would be reconciled to God. I'm sure this is a familiar carol to everyone here. Uh, It's 133 in our hymnals, projected up, and it's entitled, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Will you sing this with loud voices with me? Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Well, the other day, um, I received a a health check, and for for no other reason than the fact that, you know, it was offered through my work, and I, I decided to take up that offer. You know, but I intuitively already knew that my health was at best, I guess, staggering, and maybe even on slight decline, given the lack of exercise that I've had uh, lately. You know, I know this because I stopped wearing my my Fitbit activity tracker, and I would avoid jumping on the scales like the plague. You know, that's usually a sign that something's not right. But, you know, I think I was in a a state of denial as well. Um, So, I guess this health check was a great opportunity to confirm my current state of my health, and also to, I guess, shock me back into doing what I should be doing. You know, it wasn't all bad news, and, but there were some areas of concern, and that just made me determined to get my health and my fitness back on track. You know, I like the idea of a, a periodic health check, you know, to see what your progress is or all your digress, but either way, it gives you information that you can act on um, to get you back on track. You know, the end of the year is upon us, and Christmas is almost here. You know, I don't think there is a better time than, to, than now to stop and to check the health of our faith. You know, I think it's a good question to ask as we approach Christmas. You know, just what does the birth of the Lord Jesus mean to us personally? You know, can we find that sense of joy as we celebrate Christmas? Or are we simply overwhelmed by the burden of the festivities? Has that joy left us? And if so, how do we go about finding it again? You know, in the lead up to Christmas, I wonder if we can tune up our faith, you know, and and get it back on track. Can we find personal reasons to be able to celebrate the Lord uh, Jesus' birth? And may this truly bring us some joy. Well, our next carol uh, this morning is entitled The First Noel, 136. It is a uh, rather lengthy carol. It's got no less than six stanzas in it. But that's, that's not going to deter, deter me from this carol, and I'm, I'm determined to, to do this carol justice, all right? Six stanzas long, but we shall do this carol justice this morning. So my plan of attack for this carol is... To start in the first stanza, to sing it together, right? Powerful voices, first stanza. Then the males are going to take over in the second stanza, all right? Of course, we're all going to come in when it gets to the chorus. Then third stanza will be females, fourth stanza males, fifth stanza females. But then in the sixth stanza, which is the final one, we're going to all come in with big, powerful voices and finish this hymn and take it home, all right? Everybody with me? So together, right, male, female, male, female, final stanza all together. I will cue you. I know you're all confused out there. You look confused. Confused and a little bit scared. But we shall do this together. All right, let's, let's, let's do this. Please be seated. Thank you for your singing. And I'll hand this time to Pastor Chris. Good, that was very nice. I was listening out to the Ten of Hearts, especially those who, who, who've made that effort. Uh, uh, thank you. It sounded nice. I tried. <laughs> I, I, I just can't hit it, but uh, I just opened my mouth and pretend I was with you. <laughs> it is so nice. I like that. I would, of course, I chose uh, the different carols. And in particular, that particular cat, I really enjoy the, the, the tenor part. It's, it's like that for us. Sometimes you choose the one, I can't do it, but you know, let, let everyone sing. And so whoever you are, you know who you are. Thank you. You made my day. 
And um, well, today we are going to, I announced this earlier on, but I'm going to say it again just for those who missed out. Uh, the kids are going to have a mini concert. It's not a Christmas concert, okay, just to take note of that. It's not Christmas concert. It's just they are, they are doing it for the sure, hopefully, joy of doing it. And so uh, I'm told they have put a lot of effort into this. And so they will have this mini concert upstairs, music room. Uh, it, this is an invitation to everyone. You don't have to be their parents. You could be just here for the first time if you would like. Uh, to, to hear the children uh, sing, if you like, um, you can be there, okay? Just a few announcements I have to make concerning this particular mini-concert. It will start at 1.30, okay? Uh, but they are, we are told doors will only open at 1.15. So you got, if you go there too early, uh, look, you will be standing outside. If you go there too late... Next year, you come back. Okay, so either way, you've got to take note of this timing. At 12.45 after lunch, of course, the, uh, some of the older ones will need to take the chairs downstairs and bring it upstairs. Okay, so just be prepared to, if you are asked nicely, because sometimes you like to have your lunch and slowly sit around and chat and chat and chat. Do it next week, but this particular uh, Sunday, uh, just give it up and, and let the people take those chairs upstairs. Okay, just to take note, 12.45 and then 1.15, doors open, you'll be given a ticket. Okay, this is not a fine, no, you, you need to pay anything. you just be given a ticket and then at the end of it, uh, they are going to just for the fun of it, uh, do a raffles draw thing and you might walk away with a very special price. I will not say too much, but very special price. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, not the gold key cat you saw online, okay? Not, nothing like that, but still special. Okay, now uh, that's it. Okay, we'll not say too much. Uh, for those who want to be there, uh, we look forward to it. Okay? Well, let's, let's look forward to Christmas celebration, as Nick was talking about just then, really with all our heart, with the singing of carols, with the reading of the, the familiar Christmas passages again. And that's one of the challenge, to read something you may, you've read before, and what can we learn from this? Okay, and so this morning's uh, message over the pulpit will be, Part answering the question of some of the people who have asked, Pastor Chris, how do you read the Bible and then find yourself benefiting from it? Because sometimes when I read, I don't know what's happening. So or I read nothing. It's as good as not reading. How can I read it and ah, really benefit? I would like to share with, with everyone that how, how I go about it. Okay? And, and hopefully uh, you know, our hearts could be blessed along the way. Okay, truly. Can we read the Bible meaningfully? Absolutely, that's why I do it. What else for? Okay, can, can that faith feed from the scriptures? Can we find renewed faith daily? Absolutely possible. Right? Because Just because you haven't, therefore it doesn't exist. not true. Just would like to share with you. Okay? So part answering some questions, part thought it would be good for uh, we, we all. Uh, maybe you have your own way. By all means, share. Okay, now we're going to take a look at a, a little bit challenging text, but a wonderful text in the Bible memory verse. It's taken from Isaiah 28, 16. Okay, now let's read this one together first. So every week we have a, we can read about the Lord Jesus from the gospel we can also read about Jesus from prophetic texts. And sometimes the prophetic text gives us an insight you don't see in the gospel. Okay, well, let's take a look at this. This is a wonderful text over here. Isaiah 28, if we can appreciate this. Well, let's read it together. Okay, now, let's read this. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone 
for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Now that's an interesting word. Okay, first, these are not the words of Isaiah, not his own personal words. Who says, I will lay a stone of a foundation? It's God himself. Isaiah is but the spokesperson. That's what the prophet is. You're a spokesperson. And so God says he's going to lay a solid foundation. And I think we all need a foundation. What is the foundation of our life? Can that foundation be shaken? Is it a strong foundation? And we're not talking about a physical building. We're talking about life. And God says, I am going to lay this foundation. And of course, this foundation has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ himself as that chief cornerstone. And so whoever believes will not act hastily. And we all need to understand this. Can we trust in God's word or will we, oh, it's not happening. My prayers are not answered and we act hastily. And often in acting hastily, we can make mistakes. This is the word of the Lord. Will you patiently wait for its fulfillment or will you act hastily? See, that's what God is saying. And a lot of people can't wait. I want it now. I'm going to do it now. God, I pray, help me. You don't help me, I go somewhere else. That's called acting hastily. You see this? Foundation. I'm going to lay this. I'm going to lay a sure foundation, a precious foundation, a solid foundation for your life. Will you wait for its fulfillment or will you act hastily? Whoever believes will not act hastily. That's the word, okay? And that's how I read the scriptures. First, you got to understand what on earth it is talking about. Two, hey, is it relevant to my life? Yes. Is it instructive? Yes. So I go at the day, will I act hastily or will I believe? Okay? That's one part of it. All right? Well, this morning, we are going to take a text together in... Uh, the Gospel of Matthew. This is our classic uh, Christmas text. Okay? Well, let's take this up together. Here's the word from the Lord. So it requires faith. It requires our response. Two responses noted. One, hastily, and one, will we believe? Okay? And often, the belief part is, is a challenging one. Hastily is often the natural, uh, we just do it. We don't think, we do. And then later on, regret. That can be painful. Okay, well, let's choose the latter of, of faith now. Let's take a look at this chapter. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to read verse 18 down. This is the text, okay? And we are going to uh, take a look at how uh, this prophecy concerning the birth of Jesus was fulfilled. Well, let's read this. Matthew 1 verse 18, so you can turn to your Bible. And then we read this. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. So this is Matthew. Very candidly, he states it. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So they were engaged. They were not married. Before they came together, and Mary was found with child. In other words, she was pregnant. Of course, the husband-to-be was troubled. Truly. What happened? How did you get pregnant? And we read Joseph, her husband, being a just man. Now, in those days, you can do several things. One, you, you can break the engagement quietly or publicly. And you have every right. Publicly is you will make a pu public example of this sin. We're not married. How did you get pregnant? And then it becomes a public, uh, uh, you know, she will, her, of course, her, her character, everything will be uh, ruined in that sense. 
Okay, it becomes a public example addressing the sin problem. Now, privately is not to say you are not addressing a sin problem. You are doing it very graciously, very mercifully. You can quietly break off the engagement. And so Joseph, we read, being a just man, not wanting to make a public example of Mary, was minded to put away, uh, put her away secretly, break off engagement. Now, we read in verse 20, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take uh, to you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22. So all this was done. Now, this is Matthew's commentary, and he said, he notes this, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So those words were written down, those words were given to Joseph, but what has it got to do with us? How do I read this text and say, okay, <laughs> but okay, uh, Jesus, that's Joseph, that's him, happened many years ago, and then uh, you know, this happened to him, and then this prophecy is fulfilled, and wonderful, we can celebrate Christmas. If you read the scriptures like this, I guarantee you every time, nothing. Is this okay? Is this a story? Can we read it and actually engage it? So I tell you how I do it. I ask myself questions. What's the focus of the author? What is, why did the author say what he did? You think. And the focus of the author is there if you look hard enough. And he states this, that all this was done that it might be fulfilled. The focus here is the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, we call this the gospel account. The gospel account, the, especially with reference to the birth account of Jesus, is written by two gospel writers. One is Luke and one is Matthew. Two of them wrote. And both of them, their focus is on the fulfillment. Luke will say those things which have been fulfilled. Matthew will say, and all this was done that it might be fulfilled. So you've got to pick it up. Okay, now this is important. Now what am I learning? Why is this important? What is the significance of this focus? The gospel writer, their intention, their purpose was they write to help people find faith in Jesus. That's why they wrote. And they focus rather on just testimonies here and there, uh, you know, uh, who said what. It's not the focus, even though they were included. The focus is, do you see the prophecy that God said? And it is fulfilled. Why is this so important on two counts, at least? First thing, that the gospel of Jesus is based on truth. Number two, that the gospel account on Jesus is based on actual events that took place. This, how can it be? A virgin will give birth? That's impossible. Did it actually happen? This is the skill of the gospel writer, the birth of Christ. So who was it that was born in the major? Who was in the major? Is it an ordinary child? Is it just anyone? 
with great conviction, Matthew and Luke, this child that was born is no ordinary child. This child fulfills all that God has said, pointing to the Christ, the birth of Christ, the Christ is born. Now, this is something that we want to uh, uh, really appreciate. Because not everybody, uh, you know, there are people who say, well, how can you believe this? Are there evidence? Are there facts? Now, I'm reminded of a person who, that's how this person came to faith in Jesus. This person is called Lee Strobel. And he wrote a book called The Case for Christmas. So I'm just sharing that with some. If you look, look if you gotta, want to give a Christmas give somewhere this Christmas, it's a wonderful book. It's not too thick for starters. Sometimes we give too thick. You know. If the person receive it, is it a book? Then they look at the size. <sighs> this one, thin. This is appetizer. But don't be fooled by thin. Doesn't mean no content. Deep st good stuff, okay? So I, I like Lee Strobel, because Lee Strobel was once an atheist. This person was a legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He's a trained lawyer. He's not interested in, uh, you know, you feel this, you feel that. Show me the facts. Show me the evidence. That's what a lawyer looks for. That's what a journalist looks for. They're not interested in your emotion. Where are the facts? Where are the data? Where's this? Then I think. And so... Lee Strobel w w talked about how some of the things that drew him to faith in Jesus and eventually becoming a Christian. One was his wife, we know that. But here was another interesting story, and then he, he, he shares this in his book. He said, when he was an atheist, he was working as a journalist. He was given a project to write about some of the neediest people in Chicago. And there are rich people in Chicago, but there are also poor people. And some are really struggling. And so he was given this particular task, and he went to uh, meet with this family. And so when he met with this family, went to visit this lady, 60-year-old, grandmother, single grandmother, raising up not their own children, grandchildren. That's, that's a lot of strength needed. 13-year-old and a seven, no, another uh, child, and he was so shocked when he went there because she has arthritis, she can't work. She depends on welfare and it's hard. The place that they live in, small little place, but totally devoid of possession of any sort. There is nothing there. No furniture, no anything, no, no TV, no refrigerator, no nothing. Certainly no rugs, no picture, nothing. All they had in their possession was a table, two chairs, and a cup of rice. That's it. So he was, you know, you hear about people struggling. And then when you see for yourself, you can be quite shocked. And so he was shocked. And then he began to talk to her and found out that indeed they are struggling. She is unable to work because of arthritis. She got two granddaughters that she is raising up, and between them, they each have a dress. That's all they have, one dress each, and a sweater to share. And he says, in Chicago, when it is winter, it gets cold, really cold. And one will wear the jumper, walk. The other one freezes, shivers. And then the sister, to walk the next part of the way, hands over to the other sister. So both can keep warm while they go to school. And he was just stunned. And yet as he talked to her, he says, no, she, there is no sense of bitterness, there's no sense of self-pity, there is no sense of, but a, she will speak about still her faith in Jesus. Still her hope in Jesus, that the Lord has not forsaken her, the Lord is watching out for her. He is stumped. What are you talking about? And so, no, in his mind, 
Here is a person in poverty, and she has peace in her heart. He's, he reflects and talks about himself. I am not deprived of any physical possession. I have all the physical comfort I need. And yet, I don't even have a bit of the peace she does. And he was troubled as he went back. He couldn't get out of his mind. He really could have. So on Christmas Eve, he, he said, you know what, I'm going to visit this family just to see how they're going. Just to see well, whether they're all right. And by now, he's already published his article. And to his surprise, the people who read the, his write-up responded and poured in the gifts, the furniture, the you know, clothes, warm clothes, they literally flooded the entire apartment, turned it into a supermarket, then turned it into a department. So they had all the things given to them. And he was just as shocked, he said, in his, in his uh, account. He said, what happened? He said, look, uh, we don't know too. People just responded generously and, and gave. And so he was very happy about it, that his article did something. And he said, and, and he went and asked her, so, I don't know, how do you, uh, you know, you must be very happy. How do you feel about the whole thing? And so, uh, you know, she said, I'm very, very happy. I, I look at all this, and I'm very happy with all the people who have done this, and they're very, very good, and I, I'm so thankful. And she sees this as God's gift to her. And then she said, but this isn't it. The greatest gift that I celebrate is tomorrow, Christmas. And the gift of Jesus is far more better than any of these things. He was stumped. And then he says, you know, when he was going in, he interrupted them doing something. They were wrapping up presents. He asked, what are you doing? They were, he was, this family was literally giving away things. So why do you do that for? They are given to you. You've got nothing. People are giving to you out of the generosity of their heart. You enjoy it. They say, no. How can we have all this while other people have nothing? So we're going to give out. No, we don't need uh, you know, 10 jackets. You're going to give out all these other ones. We're going to give this away. We're going to give that away. going to give this. And he was so stumped. Then he went back and he thought, here I am. This, this lady really is, is, has nothing, and yet she, she has this faith of her. She has a special joy, a special peace, a special generosity. And he looks at himself. All I have is material things, anxiety, loneliness. All I care about is myself. What do I really have? And a lot of people actually have the same problem today. And he shares this to, to tell people, this is what I was like before I had Jesus in my life. I had all these physical things, but I had nothing. He used to celebrate Christmas and think it's just an excuse for corporate America, greedy corporate America, more buying. That's it. That's what Christmas is all about. But it changed when he too came to know Jesus. You see, this is why the gospel writers, they were once upon a time people who did not have the gift of Jesus in their heart, in their life too. This is Matthew, tax collector. You know what a tax collector is like in those days? 10% is the official, 30%. Tax, 10, 20 goes into my pocket. They were rich like anything. That's why they so hated, you see. Who likes the tax man? Put up your hand. Right? We all think we are tax me. The moment which politician imposed more tax? This one, bad fellow. I liked him until he did it. Who likes the tax man? Who here is doing tax? See, don't dare to put up your hand too much. Right? You do tax, of course, you look into tax. But you, if you are the taxer, is there such a word? You are the one that collects tax. Matthew knew. The poverty of knowing only riches, but no faith in Jesus. 
And he has experienced what it means to not have these things, but to have Christ as something that he has received. And he wanted to share this with people. Now, he knows, like a tax man, I want to see figures, I want to see facts. Is this real? Is this true? So he does his research too. Did you know all these things were done? That it might be fulfilled. Is this a true account? Now, how did they come with faith? Now, let's take a look at prophecy, because prophecy, you will always see two parts, the divine factor and the human factor. The two parts, right? God actually gave this word originally to I- through Isaiah to King Ahaz. King Ahaz, king of Judah, was a king that did not believe in God. You see, they are meant to be God's people. To them, faith in God is nothing more than a religion and ritual. And to a lot of people, it's like that too. That faith in God is about just a religion. I'm a Christian. I practice the religious faith and go through some rituals. That's it. Faith is not personal. And so God spoke to this king to help him find faith in him. He tells Isaiah, go to Ahaz and tell him, ask for a sign. This is how God is trying to help him. You are unbelieving. You won't trust me. In a time of war, you're not going to trust me. I'm going to try and help you here. Ask for a sign. Ask any sign you wish. Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I'm not going to test God. You know what that is? That is just a polite way of saying, no, thank you. So here is God wanting to help you find faith and you tell him, no, thanks. I'm not interested. I'm more interested. I'm just interested in just practicing religion as just go to church. Okay, you want me to follow some ritual? I follow some ritual. But don't trouble me with personal faith. That is Ahaz. And so God says to him, If you do not believe, it will not be established in you. Well, that's true today too. His word will not be established in us when we cannot have, don't have that personal faith in him. So now it is given to two, Mary and Joseph. Will they believe? God sends now, not prophet, angel. He sends an angel. And he tells them, let's, let's take a look at this. Mary's account, for example. I think this is worthwhile reading, right? Joseph believed, he struggled. He needed to explain further. So that's how you find faith, you see. You, you struggle with it. And then here the angel, messenger of the Lord, explained things. And he, 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 he did it. He went on and said, okay, I'm going to take Mary as my wife. I'm going to believe her. I'm going to believe what God said is going to be it. That's faith. Now, here's Mary. Did she struggle? Yes. Okay, it's not easy to find personal faith. It's easy to have a religion. Easy. To go to church, to follow rituals, that's easy. You just go with the flow. You sing, I sing. You sit, I sit. You open Bible, I open Bible. You put offering, I put offering. Don't take, okay? You put, (laughs) right? You just go with the flow. Easy. Find personal faith. Harder. You got to struggle. You gotta listen. You gotta say, can I believe this? Can I act on it? All right now, let's take a look at Luke over here, which is really this is Mary. He gives a very candid account of Mary. Okay, Luke chapter one and then verse 26. We read these words over here. Right? The six months, and then uh, Angel Gabriel sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Can you imagine this? That the prophecy, the great prophecy of the Messiah, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And that virgin is you, Mary. See, that's how we read God's word. We don't read it as personal. We tend to read it, it's going to happen to someone else, but not me. I'm just common. I'm just pretty ordinary. Uh, you know, I've just, 
ordinary Joe. No offense to the name Joe, but that's just being ordinary. But it's going to happen to other people. You are that virgin. You are that chosen vessel. You are going to be blessed by God. You are going to bear the Son of God. Imagine the news given to you when it dawns upon you. You mean I am going to... Well, what was her reply? Okay, her reply was very humble, good. But but this is honest humble, not fake humble. But she said uh, to... Look at her. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How can this be? Since I do not know a man... How can I have a child without being married? This is an honest question. This is a struggle, a good one. You ask question. You really can't. How can, is it possible? So remember, uh, Zacharias, his, his one was unbelief. Mary's one is quite different. So God knows this, he, can, he knows this question that is coming forth is not out of unbelief. It's coming out of sincerity. And then the answer was given. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he goes on to tell her, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived in old age, which is impossible. Now, verse 37, this was the word. This was the word, that the turning point. And says to her, for God nothing will be impossible. Is the Christmas account a supernatural account? Yes. Is it a miracle? Absolutely. Can it be scientifically proven? No. Did it happen? Yes. Huh? Can we believe in it? That's the struggle. Even among people who say, wow, we are believers. Can I believe that with God, nothing will be impossible? Let's apply that into our life. Sometimes we read the Bible and we feel that, oh, it's very hard. Short of thinking is impossible. It's so hard for me to change. It's so hard for me to be faithful. It's so hard for me to, it's just so hard. It's trying to tell God it's impossible. Here is a reply. With God, nothing is impossible. Now, it's up to you to take on that one. For Mary, these were her words of faith. She said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departed. That's what it means to believe. Let it be according to this word that God has given. It will happen. This is our faith. Did she struggle? Yes. Did she finally find this faith overcoming struggle? So when we read the Bible, we struggle. We do struggle. You need someone to explain further. You can't do this on your own if you're not able to. Find help. Go to someone who is able to help and explain further how this word applies to your life and when you can. Watch that faith. Now, this this was Elizabeth's observation and he said these words because they struggled as well and they finally found faith. Verse, uh, over here, verse 45. Blessed is she, talking about Mary, who believed For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Ahaz will go down in history as an unbelieving king of Judah. They go down in history. That's her, him. See, that faith is never going to be established in him. He didn't believe. But for Mary, she is going to go down in history, blessed. Because she believed. The blessing of God is not, oh, I I pray a blessing for you, it will be fulfilled. No. The fulfillment depends on you. It depends on your faith in God applied into life and lived out. It is not a, a, a service here, a church, we call it church blessing. But the blessing is not in the service, but in the life. 
That life, if you will not obey the Lord's word, if you will not believe, no blessing. There is no blessing. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of the things that were said about her, for her. That word, that prophetic word will now be fulfilled in your life. What a thought. What a thought. She will have the joy of faith. That's what it is. That joy of faith was her, not Ahaz, not Israel. They refuse to listen, refuse to be helped. Here is Isaiah. Can you imagine? There's no Isaiah today, okay? Well, you can name your son Isaiah. That's not the same. But there's no prophet to help you. And you, here is a prophet. This is a great servant of God wanting to help you. Ask for a sign. No thanks. <sighs> okay, gone. No thanks. Now, I'm not going to ask you ask for a sign because I'm not a prophet. It was given, that virgin, that prophecy concerning the birth is a sign. Will you believe? No. They struggled, but they arrived at belief. Struggle, I tell the people who ask me about reading the Bible. But find that help. Can I help you connect? Can I help you see how this is fulfilled? Not only in prophecy, but in your life. In our life. Blessed is she. May it be blessed are you because you believe. May you be blessed this Christmas with all my heart. May you be blessed. I have a trainer that we go for six, six o'clock in the morning. We go, me and Aldine go for exercise. We take turns. Uh, six in the morning in the park in winter too. And uh, we have a trainer that is really, in my heart, an inspiration because Christmas, she writes a Christmas card to every single one <laughs> of her. I said, how many people do you have? You know, under you, oh, a uh, couple of hundred hearts. <laughs> you have written a couple of hundred Christmas card personal, each one. You could have written, dear Eldin and Chris, well done. Of course, well done as I put one. It's, right? But you know, he, you know, he's pressing on. Come on, don't give up. Kind of a thing. But each one, you're going to help me? You're going to help me find greater sense of strength and health and that? Well, thank you. You see, we all need this. This Christmas, let's encourage people. Can, can we find that help? If you find your own faith weaker, weaker, do something about it. Do something about it. If there's unbelief, can we, un can we do something about it? Find that faith. Is there help? God wants to help. He has always wanting to help. Even an atheist like Lee Strobel. Is there any atheist out there? I don't think so. <laughs> Otherwise, you won't come to church. But maybe you are, maybe I'm leaning. Well, go and find that. You want facts? Come and find it. Find that faith for yourself. But perhaps we are here Christians, but we somehow have lost that joy of believing in the fulfillment of the word of God, personal, in our life. Don't lose it. Don't let time pass and it becomes cold. The word of God was meant to be fulfilled. When we read it, you are, we are part of history in the making. God is fulfilling, but you've got to believe. You are part of this. Great plan that the prophecies, the word is being fulfilled. What a thought. I celebrate Christmas absolutely with a great sense of joy. Not because there are things that I have. And I'm thankful, grateful to God that I am not devoid of needs and possession. But these are the things that, not the things that make me happy and fulfilled. Is that child in the major, the son of God the Holy One, the Son who is given to us. Let's pray together and then ask that the Lord will grant us his grace and strength to overcome unbelief and to believe once again in the fulfillment of God's word. We gotta do our part in obedience, in faith. God will help. God will send his messengers. Will we receive it? Will we say, 
help me believe. Help my unbelief. That would be a wonderful start to a great Christmas coming up. Let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that as we read this account all over again, may we read it with eyes of faith, not just words of a page, but actual words that came from you with the power of fulfillment when we believe that blessing would be released into our life. Help us to take heed like Joseph, like Mary, to believe that we are part of that great plan of yours in that kingdom of your son. Oh, we pray that as we give an offering, we give not of ritual, not of religion, but we give with meaning and understanding and love for the Lord Jesus Christ, for who he is to us. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I chose one last hymn. It can go either way. I was hoping this message, you know, when you listen, wow, I, I, can I find this word and it can be fulfilled and then my joy becomes greater? I hope so. This, this Christmas carol that I've chosen is called How Great Our Joy. Like I say, it can go either way. Right? And it's wonderful. The joy of faith. And can it be yours? See, we read this in the Bible. We hear of other people. Well, sometimes we, perhaps we don't even think it can happen. That's unbelief. That really is unbelief. Is it for us? Mary, ordinary. Joseph, even more ordinary. And ordinary people God used to bring about his fulfillment. They believed. That's what made all the difference. There's a great king with every reason to believe, and yet he didn't. That's the sad reality, too. That joy of belief was never his. It was not established. But it was for Mary. Let this be ours, even as we go from here. Well, let's sing this. How great our joy how great that joy is in believing in the Lord, in believing in the scriptures, in the certainty of God's word, in believing in who Jesus is, in knowing Jesus, that he is the son of the highest, he is the holy one, he is the son of God, he is the savior who will save us from our sins, he is Emmanuel, God with us. How great our joy. Let's rise as we sing this together, okay? We joy, they cannot, <laughs> that would be wonderful. Believe in it. And that belief will create a wonderful, wonderful, great joy that would fill our heart. I wish you great joy this Christmas, I really do. Well, let's sing this together. Okay, we're going to sing the last stanza. Since you're already doing it, you know there is an echo. Okay, I'm going to do a Nick thing. Okay, last stanza where it says, how great our joy. Men, would you lead this one? Great our joy, please. Yes, smiles and all. How great our joy in the Savior. Ladies, you don't mind? Great our joy, support, support okay? Especially if your husband is trying his best, please show some support. If you, if, of course, if you're married out there. Okay, and then uh, joy, 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 again, ref refrain, joy, 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 praise we the Lord in heaven on high, and then uh, the echo, praise we the Lord. Can we work together? Yeah, can men and women live in harmony? I believe so, with great joy too. Let's, let's try, last stanza. You can sing together in harmony. There can be joy among the men and the women together. May you have this joy with all my heart. I, I really really mean it why do we bring messages over the pulpit like this that we may know the joy of faith let it be yours let's ask that the lord will bless us and now may this great god of ours 
who has given us the word of life, Jesus himself. Create within our hearts renewed faith, renewed hope that would result in much joy for life, for strength. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ enable us to believe again and again the word of God. May the spirit of God enlighten us with understanding to apply it in our life that we may walk in the light and know the joy of the Lord's blessings that would come upon all who walk by faith. Now and even forevermore, the name of the Lord Jesus, we exalt and bless. Amen.